you in the name of Jesus Christ um, and uh, of course send greetings on behalf of the institutions of which I am a part. Uh, I'm a proud member of your sister church uh, on the other side of this block, uh, University Church. Send greetings from that community and of course from Chicago Theological Seminary. And of course I want to thank uh, pastors uh, Lucia and Johnson for this invitation. Uh, it's really an honor. Uh, nice to meet you, Pastor Lucia, for the first time. And uh, Pastor Veronica, it's great to see you again. Um, I have stories, so if you stay for coffee, I, I can share some with you. <laughs> I, uh, I got sick earlier this week. I tested. I'm good. But uh, you might hear some of that in my voice, so I apologize ahead of time. Uh, will you join me in a quick word of prayer? Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us. Amen. The dictionary defines power as, among other things, political or national strength, strength, might, force, the possession of control and command over others, authority, ascendancy, Power as political strength, might, force, command over others. Palm Sunday has nothing to do with power. Or, or nothing to do with power as we understand it. In fact, Jesus, by riding on a docile donkey, challenges our notions of what it means to be truly powerful. Now this needs some historical explanation. The noted New Testament scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan tell us that prior to Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, there was another procession. You see, it was just before that great Jewish festival of Passover. And since the people of Israel were an occupied province of Rome, and since there will be Jews coming from all over to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem, it was customary for the governor to come in and make sure that these pious Jews didn't get rowdy. Jerusalem had been a city of protests and attempted insurrections against Roman occupation. And the High Holy Days often fomented the rebellious, revolutionary aspirations of the Jewish people. Therefore, the governor and his army would leave his beachfront property on the coast of the Mediterranean and reinforce the Roman garrison that overlooked the Jewish temple. Like the Illinois National Guard coming at your front steps of the church, for fear that pastors Lucia and Johnson were starting some rebellion. <laughs> Somebody check outside. And to make his presence felt, the governor, in this case Pontius Pilate, would have a triumphant entry of his own. Borg and Crossan define the scene vividly. And I quote, a visual panoply of imperial power cavalry of horses, foot soldiers, 
leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, sun glinting in metal and gold, intimidating imperial sounds, the marching of feet, the cracking of leather, the clinging of bridles, and the beating of drums, end quote. There were two processions around this time. The gospel writers don't bother to write Pilate's entry because it was common knowledge to their intended audiences. Hence, upon reading Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, early hearers of Luke's gospel would automatically hearken back to the yearly processions of ruthless, faithless, demoralizing governors into their holy city, implied in the gospel's telling of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is Pontius Pilate's procession of imperial intimidation. Palm Sunday places us between two processions. Pilate came from the west, you know, the coastal town, on a war horse and chariot, protected by a whole brigade of troops armed to the teeth. Jesus came from the east on a beast of burden, on a cult, unarmed and vulnerable. Pontius Pilate's march into Jerusalem was about political strength, might, force, command over others, about power. Jesus' parade seems rather powerless, just a cult and nothing else. Pilate's entry intimidates. Jesus' entry inspires. Pilate is about power over, Jesus about power under. Pilate about power from above, Jesus about power from below. Pilate about allegiance to the centers of power. Jesus about commitment to the margins among the powerless, the voiceless, the neglected, and the ignored ones of this world. In light of Pilate's display of power, Jesus' Palm Sunday entry is an anti-political, political demonstration. As Borg and Crossan put it, it was a prearranged, you know, he had a cult lined up. It was a prearranged, he was a good community organizer. It was a prearranged counter procession. Or as Gary Wills phrased it, it was a systematic anti politics. And processing into the city on a simple donkey, Jesus is demonstrating, paradoxically, the true power of powerlessness. Bible scholar Teresa Lockhart Strickland writes, and I quote, God's sovereign way of peace, which is manifest in the weak things of this world, is stronger than the military might of nations, end quote. Now, the common way folks preach Palm Sunday story is to emphasize the fickleness of Jesus' followers, then and now, who in less than a week go from praising Hosanna to jeering, crucify him. Now that's an easy way out of this story. We know we're fickle. We don't need Palm Sunday to tell us that. Plus, Jerusalem's a big city. During the high holy days, like Passover, that big city would double or triple in population. So who even knows if the Hosanna crowd is the same as the crucify him crowd? I am certain Jesus was not the only rabbi in town with a following. It's a big city. I mean, like, like look at Chicago. Just because there's a few righteous people who, inspired by the Holy Spirit, rightly root for the White Sox, doesn't mean that there aren't others who, bewitched by Satan, <laughs> sinfully cheer for the Cubs. Just an example. <laughs> the question of Palm Sunday is not what crowd we're in. We're usually in both. The more precise, the more incisive question of Palm Sunday is whose procession draws our attention? 
whose procession captures our gaze? The one led by Jesus Christ on a cult, or the one led by Pontius Pilate on his war horse? That we're fickle, <clears throat> that's easy to own up to. What is harder to admit, harder to accept, is about the encounter with Palm Sunday, is that it reveals to us our allure to worldly power. To the fact that sometimes we're hooked on worldly power. I teach a history of religious thought at your favorite seminary, Chicago <laughs> Theological Seminary, shameless plug, right down the street. Do I have to pay for the advertisement? <laughs> and I can, I can say on good authority that the church has been part of the wrong procession way too often. We as the church too often are part, still, of Pilate's procession, yeah. not Jesus. Yeah. We're sometimes hooked on forceful power. What makes it hard for us to follow a Messiah who calls us to the paradoxical power of vulnerability. We ascend the social and political halls of power for our own sake, for our own security, seeking to gain self-serving control. We amass wealth and might to gain social prestige and to surround ourselves with the luxuries of life with little to no concern for, with those who don't even have a donkey or even a cloak. And what is worse, we at times do all this in Jesus' name. We justify these self-serving machinations of power and think that that will do, that that makes it Christian. In effect, all we've done is take Pilate's chariot and put a I heart Jesus bumper sticker on it. There's no substance, no transforming impetus, no radical conversion. And simply slapping on a Jesus bumper sticker on a death-dealing Roman chariot. This is bumper sticker Christianity. Yeah. And boy, our country, our empire, is chock full of pious platitude stickers on imperial arsenal. Yes. Bumper sticker Christianity. Yeah. You see, when those televangelist charlatans take grandma's retirement savings to buy a luxury jet to supposedly spread the gospel. They're just putting a Jesus sticker under chariots of imperial greed. Whenever the church worries more about its adorned temples than about those without a roof over their heads, it is just slapping a Jesus sticker on the armor of imperial opulence. When Christians hypocritically tout their political commitment to family values while separating kids and infants from the undocumented parents. They're just posting a Jesus sticker on the swords of imperial cruelty. When Christians spread hatred and violence towards queer folk, veiling their vitriol in the shallow defense of marriage, is simply tagging a Jesus sticker on the battalion of imperial hate. When the church distorts then scapegoats critical race theory to cloak their deep-seated racism, it adheres a Jesus sticker on the whips of imperial oppression. When Christians choose the racist, the racist status quo that privileges white feelings instead of protecting black lives, they're putting a Jesus sticker they're putting a Jesus sticker on the army of imperial crucifixions. But there's more, because I know we're progressive. High Park, Second City's intelligentsia. That's not us. But whenever we choose comfort or indifference or not ruffling feathers in the face of any of these imperial schemes, even if we're not acting in them, we are being allured and wooed by the wrong procession. High Park Union Church, fellow followers of Christ, friends, Palm Sunday challenges us to go beyond bumper sticker religion yes. and to stick our, to, to kick our power seeking habit, our addiction to the illusion of control. Palm Sunday challenges us to live lives that bust, bust, about, uh, boast, not in worldly might and wealth, but in the love, righteousness, and justice of God. 
It challenges us to switch processions. That's the challenge before us today. Now there's one more consideration that we must attend to here. How do we meet this challenge? Pilate's procession is quite alluring. And as I said, we are kind of fickle. So where shall we find the strength in this text to opt for a modest mule and not a shiny chariot? Well, at first, I'll be honest, and maybe it's my lack of homiletical depth. I, I'll be honest with you, I had a hard time finding the carrot or the stick, the strength or the promise of the text. And then I noticed something peculiar. When we read this story as Luke tells it, Jesus entering Jerusalem gets all the attention that we forget that Jesus is leaving the Mount of Olives. Now, this is no small thing. Uh, Luke is, if any of you have studied Bible, Luke is very intentional. Everything Luke does has deep intention. This is no small thing, and the writer Luke wants us to know that it's no small thing. Did you notice in our text that Jerusalem is mentioned by name once, but the Mount of Olives is mentioned twice? Uh, Luke wants us to focus on the Mount of Olives. Why, you ask? Well, in the apocalyptic imagination of first century Jews, the Mount of Olives was the site of the eschatological end. It was the site of the hope at the end of history. It was the site where the Messiah would come and God's promise of cosmic redemption and wholeness would come about. The Mount of Olives. Not Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives. It was the Mount of Olives where, where God would begin to set all things right, where injustice would be overturned and life abundant reign, where God, the God of life would have the last word. Where the God, you hear me, where the God of life would have the last word. Now I know it sounds naive to hope, but when crushed by the dread of empire, hopeful naivete, is more disruptive than Stoic realism. Mount of Olives. We take the risk with Christ on the modest mule without the empire's supposed safety and security because even if we die, and some have died for this, even if we die, we hope, Mount of Olives, we hope, we trust that God will have the last word. God will have the last word. In his last public address, the day before he was killed, a tired and weary Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King boldly declared, you probably remember those, you King scholars out there, and I quote, I don't know what will happen now, but, I, but we've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter to me now because I've been to the mountaintop. Facing Pontius Pilate, Martin Luther King Jr. had his house, had his eyes set on the Mount of Olives. Because I have been to the mountaintop. See, God will have the last word. So church friends, fellow, follow Christ with boldness, trusting against all odds that God will have the last word. Church friends, join Christ from the Mount of Olives in his counter demonstration of power, trusting that the systems of subjugation cannot contain the spirit of resurrection. Yes. Move forward with Christ, knowing that the crucifying powers of this world are no match for the living God. Yes. That empires built on crosses lynching trees and militarized borders are no match for the risen Christ who shattered the very gates of hell. Church friends, denounce with Christ the imperial procession of death. Take up your call on this Palm Sunday, trusting that imperial greed won't have the last word, generosity will. That imperial opulence won't have the last word, grace will. That imperial cruelty won't have the last word. Mercy will. 
that imperial hate won't have the last word, love will. That imperial oppression won't have the last word, liberation will. That the liber that imperial sac crucifixion won't have the last word, resurrection will. Church, go forth. Friends, go forth. But don't forget the Mount of Olives. Go forth, join the choirs of angels and the choir of martyrs in singing, defiantly singing. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord.